Good morning, good morning. Welcome to White Oak Baptist Church. Uh, please find your places, and as you do, if you would pick up your hymnals, turn to hymn 676, The Lily of the Valley, and please stand together with me. We're going to sing the entire song together. I have found a friend in Jesus, he's everything to me. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. The lily of the valley, in him alone I see. All I need to cleanse and make me fully whole. In sorrow he's my comfort, in trouble he's my stay. He tells me every care on him to roll. Hallelujah! He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. Number two. He all my griefs hath taken, and all my sorrows born. In temptation he's my strong and mighty tower. I have all for him forsaken, and all my idols torn. From my heart and now he keeps me by his power. Though all the world forsake me, and Satan tempt me sore, through Jesus I shall safely reach the goal. Hallelujah! He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. Number three. He will never, never leave me, nor yet forsake me here, while I live by faith and do his blessed will. Oh, all of fire about me, I'm nothing now to fear. With his manna he my hungry soul shall fill. Then sweeping up to glory, I'll see his blessed face, where rivers of delight shall ever roll. Hallelujah, he's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. Good morning. Aren't you glad we have a God who's a beautiful God? A God that's worthy of our uh, worship and our praise and uh, glad to be able to come together and do that with you today. What a great week we've had here at the church this week. Uh, Thursday night, Angela had an activity with many of the ladies over at a uh, local farm and they got ice cream and saw some animals. And then Friday, we had mystery date night with the married couples and we had, I guess, probably nine or ten couples go out. We had a good laugh at all of their expenses uh, we told them we we're taking you out for fine dining, but we didn't tell them where we were taking them. So we got them all on the bus, and we were headed down the road to that Hibachi Grill place across from the mall. I never can remember the name of that place. Too complicated for me. What's the name of it? Tangas. Yeah, Tangas. There it is. Anyway, we got uh, close, and Pastor Dave was driving the bus. He pulled into the Sonic uh, uh, parking lot, and everybody got really <laughs> quiet. Oh, it was hilarious. Everyone got really nervous, and I said, all right, everybody know what you're going to get here? And so then we, uh, we pulled out, and it was a big sigh of relief, but it was a good time, and, and we're just glad to have the chance to honor marriage and to lift it up and hold it high as God defines it, and very thankful for uh, God's creation with that and how that represents the relationship He has with the church. One day He's going to present us as His bride to His Heavenly Father, and that's going to be a good day. And just bring full circle, aren't you glad He's a beautiful God? Amen. And so we're going to honor him today and praise him and some attributes about him in, this, in the sermon today. Before we do that, before we get it, go any further, let's greet one another in the Lord, shake each other's hands. We'll come back and sing that chorus in just a minute. Let's sing that first verse together as we find our seats. I have found a friend in Jesus. He's everything to me. He's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. The lily of the valley, in him alone I see. All I need to cleanse and make me fully whole. In sorrow he's my comfort, in trouble he's my stay. 
He tells me every care on him to roll. Hallelujah, he's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. And I think as the author wrote that song, he was writing that song to be a love letter uh, to God. And so very thankful that he is the fairest of 10,000s. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Remembering Pauline Moyick, uh, she was admitted to the hospital on Monday with cellulitis. And last I heard, she's still there. And so pray for her that God will touch her and heal her up. She specifically requested nobody send her flowers or candy, any of that stuff. She's a, she's a tough gal, but a sweet gal. So I got to go by and spend some time with her uh, yesterday. And uh, we, uh, we just pray that God uh, heals her out of that bed of infirmity quickly and restores her back to us. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, asking Him to give us a good day in his house. Ask Pastor Mike to come and pray for us. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this morning that you've given to us, Lord. This is the day you have made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We think of Pauline Moyek. Would you uh, bless her and touch her heart, uh, touch her body. Lord, provide a healing for her, Lord. We pray you bless our service. Be with those that are have uh, hurting hearts. Lord, may it be mended this morning. Speak to us through thy word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. And take your hymnals again, please, and turn to hymn 657, A New Name in Glory. We'll sing the entire song. <clears throat> I was once a sinner, but I came pardon to receive from my Lord. This was freely given, and I found that he always kept his word. There's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine, oh yes, it's mine. And the white-robed angels sing the story. A sinner has come home, for there's a new name written down in glory. And it's mine, oh yes, it's mine. With my sins forgiven, I am bound for heaven, never more to roam. Number two, I was humbly kneeling at the cross, fearing not but God's angry frown. When the heavens opened and I saw that my name was written down. There's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine, oh yes, it's mine. And the white-robed angels sing the story, a sinner has come home. For there's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine, oh yes, it's mine. With my sins forgiven, I am bound for heaven, never more to roam. Number three, in the book tis written, saved by grace, oh, the joy that came to my soul. Now I am forgiven, and I know by the blood I am made whole. For there's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine, oh yes, it's mine. And the white-robed angels sing the story, a sinner has come home. For there's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine, oh yes, it's mine. With my sins forgiven, I am bound for heaven, never more to roam. All right, you all are guilty of the same thing that the first service was guilty of, and that's singing that song with a frown on your face. Your name is written in glory. I can't think of a more exciting thing a more, uh, anything more to rejoice about. You're going to die one day if you're saved and you're going to go to heaven. And so we're going to sing that chorus again, but we're going to do it this time with a smile on our face. All right. Brother Jay, come back up here and lead us in that chorus. Let's smile while we sing that. 
All right, from the chorus, a little introduction there, and we'll get right into that. For there's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine, oh yes, it's mine. And the white-robed angels sing the story, a sinner has come home. For there's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine, oh yes, it's mine. With my sins forgiven, I am bound for heaven, never more to roam. How many here remember the day you were saved? Can you raise your hand? How many remember the date you were saved? You don't have to know the date to uh, go to heaven. But Jim, what was the day you were saved? Who else remembers the day they were saved with Ed? March 13th, 19... 1907? 1907. 1970, okay. Wow, I got a drink from the fountain you're drinking from. Who else remembers the day they were saved? Right here, Ed Cowan? September 30th, 2012. Anybody else? Right back here. Yes, sir. April 7th, 2017, sitting right down here. On, on a Resurrection Sunday. Amen. Aren't you glad you're saved? Ushers, you come on forward and we'll prepare to meet our guests. If you're visiting with us today for the first time or it's been a long time since you've been here, we'd like to put a connection card in your hand and thank you for being here as our honored guest. If you wouldn't mind, just quickly slip up your hand and we'd like to give you one of those. Anybody visiting? Right down front uh, here and uh, met, a, met this gentleman here at the beginning of the service. He's from West Virginia, not too far from where I used to live. And he's here. is this your son next to you? Very good. I'm sorry, sister next to you. Very good. And glad, thrilled to death that you're here. You up from West Virginia as well? Very good. Very good. Well, glad you two came up and, and you're here with us uh, today. Anybody else visiting? All right. Right over here. Okay. Matt and Leah has, who's this? This is your sister, Candace, from Pennsylvania. Are you the one I met? Okay. Yeah, I met her at my previous ministry. And so I was candidating here, and she was taking, getting a tour of the school, and, and, uh, and I, we got talking, and we, we made the connection there. I'm thrilled to death that you're in town and able to be here with us today. Thank you all for being here, your honored guest. And if there's anything we can do for you, please let us know. If you don't mind, fill out that card, drop it in the offering plate when the offering passes by. This time we'll have our choir come, and they'll, they'll sing for us. together one last time and also standing let's turn to hymn 397 and we'll sing together trusting Jesus we'll sing the first and the fourth
simply trusting every day, trusting through a stormy way, even when my faith is small, trusting Jesus that is all, trusting as the moments fly, trusting as the days go by, trusting Him whate'er befall, trusting Jesus that is all. Number four, trusting Him while life shall last, Trusting Him till earth be past, till within the jasper wall. Trusting Jesus that is all, trusting as the moments fly, trusting as the days go by. Trusting Him, whate'er befall, trusting Jesus, that is all. You may be seated. Please make your way forward, ushers. Isn't the singing beautiful this morning? Um, when a heart is tender to the Lord, the music is really sweet. Uh, we have a total of six teenagers going to the Hammond uh, Youth Conference uh, there may be a couple extra, so uh, six or eight uh, teens going to the Hammond Youth Conference. So uh, me and my wife, Pastor and his wife, will be departing uh, tomorrow at 10 p.m. Uh, for that trip uh, to go to Hammond Youth Conference. We'll be there from, uh, from uh, Tuesday till Friday, uh, Friday leaving Friday morning uh, for, for the uh, uh, return back to our, uh, the church. So it's an exciting uh, thing. I'm looking forward to it. I can't wait to see what God has in store for not only the teenagers, but us as leadership here uh, for that conference. Uh, Brother Jason Magnarella, could you pray for this morning's offering?
King. Take my lips and let them be filled with messages for Thee. Take my silver and my gold, not a All right, men, thank you very much. Love to hear men singing about how they want to give their entire selves to the Lord so that He can use them. 1 Kings chapter 8 in your Bibles. 1 Kings 8, while you're turning there, I have a couple of really important announcements about some events coming up in the next week or so uh, that I need the whole church body to give uh, ear to. First of all, if you are helping with our Vacation Bible School Neighborhood Bible Time, if you're going to be helping with that either throughout the week as a teacher or helper or uh, in the morning or the evening, there is a very, very important and mandatory meeting that will take place this coming up Saturday at 6 p.m. 6 p.m. upstairs in our fellowship also. Please make very important note of that and make every effort to be there so that we'll all be ready to go and on the same page. The church has always put on a phenomenal vacation Bible school. This year is going to be up a notch, up a step, and you'll want to, uh, you'll want to be here uh, so that you know what's going on and, and you're in the know. Uh, the next thing, and this applies to the whole church body, and that would be um, a week from Friday or the Friday of the Neighborhood Bible Time Vacation Bible School, there's going to be an awards ceremony at 7 p.m. And you say, well, I don't have kids or grandkids that are going to be involved. And to that, I would say, come anyway. Um, there's going to be uh, a rewarding of the children for their efforts during the week. But on top of that, we're going to have a lot of families that have been touched by uh, Neighborhood Bible Time, uh, and they will be here, and that will be a great chance for you to be able to connect with that crowd and, uh, and try to connect them into our church. If you are a Sunday school teacher, let me really encourage you to be here that night so that you can connect with new families who are trying to be introduced to our church, and you can try to corral them into your Sunday school class on a Sunday. I'd really encourage you all to be here and, and uh, support our children and, and meet our, our new guests. And let's have White Oak Baptist Church put its, put its best foot forward to these uh, visiting families that will be here on that Friday evening. That'll be a week from this coming up Friday, so take note of that. 1 Kings 8, let's stand for the reading of God's Word this morning. 1 Kings chapter 8, we're going to begin in verse 54 and read responsively down through verse 57. The Bible says in verse 54, And it was so that when Solomon made an end of praying all this prayer and supplication unto the Lord, he arose from before the altar of the Lord, from kneeling on his knees with his hands spread up to heaven. Verse 55, together. And he stood and blessed all the congregation of Israel with a loud voice, saying, Blessed be the Lord that hath given rest unto his people Israel, according to all that he promised. There hath not failed one word of all his good promise, which he promised by the hand of Moses, his servant. The Lord our God be with us, as he was with our fathers. Let him now leave us and forsake us. Let him not leave us and forsake us. And this morning, if you paid, paid close attention there to verse 56, Solomon emphasized that God follows through in his word, he keeps his promises, which brings us to the title of the sermon today, God's Amazing Faithfulness. God's Amazing Faithfulness. Let's pray. This morning, Lord, we're so thankful for your uh, faithfulness, Lord, that you always are there for us every time we need you. And Lord, I pray that would be something that we cling to and is not something that we run to, uh, run from rather. And Lord, I pray today that you'd help us as we try uh, for just a few short moments with the frailty of the language that we have in comparison to an awesome God as we try to explain this morning, just how amazing your faithfulness, uh, faithfulness is, would you give us grace? Would you give, us, uh, give me uh, the words to say? Lord, I pray that the ears of those listening would uh, be opened and they would receive the words not just in the, into their brains but down into their heart. 
And Lord, may we be challenged, Lord, by your faithfulness to be more faithful to what you've called us to. Lord, may we be challenged by your faithfulness to be people of greater faith. We ask all these things in Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. You can be seated. Solomon built an incredible temple from the Lord. Uh, it's known in the Bible as Solomon's Temple, and really through history as Solomon's Temple. And uh, in America, if we were going to uh, open up a new building, uh, the, our culture would dictate that you have a ribbon, ribbon cutting ceremony, right? And that there'd be all kinds of festivities around that ribbon cutting ceremony. That, that was not the case. I have to say, I like the way that Solomon did it better than uh, the way that we would do it here in our culture. Solomon didn't have a ribbon cutting ceremony. He had a prayer dedication. And I think that's just phenomenal. He gathered all of Israel together and him as the political leader and acting as the spiritual leader, he stood up before the Israelites or rather in front of the Israelites, got down on a knee and prayed uh, one of the most spiritual prayers that he absolutely could have prayed, dedicating this temple, this place of worship, this dwelling place of a holy God, dedicating it to Jehovah God. And in so doing, God was very pleased with that. We picked up the reading at the very end of that prayer where he stood up and he praised the God of heaven for being a God who was faithful, a God that keeps his promises, a God who always comes through on what he said. But where did it all begin for Solomon? You may remember going back to King David, that King David was on his deathbed, and he was there being taken care of by a young damsel who was making sure that he had enough heat to stay alive. And uh, in, that, in those last waning moments of his life, he looked at his wife, then wife Bathsheba, and he said to her, I would like Solomon, your son, our son, Solomon, to be the king. I think that that's a great testimony of God's grace. Obviously, we know about the promiscuous act that David committed uh, with uh, Bathsheba there and how that God took away their first child, but God honored their marriage nonetheless and gave them another child named Solomon. And Solomon would shortly after the death of David, David be made the king of Israel. Solomon started out scared out of his mind. And I wonder, uh, I think it's a fair speculation to make that he had some rocky roads right out of the gate. He had some problems that he was faced with that he just didn't quite know how to handle. You say, well, pastor, what makes you to believe that? Well, while the Bible doesn't tell us directly uh, what those problems may have been, or even if there were problems. We do know that shortly after he was made king, he retreated uh, to a, a private, quiet place where he spent hours and hours uh, performing sacrifices to the Lord and hours and hours in prayer. God had, in a way, backed Solomon into a corner, and Solomon made the right choice. Solomon chose to seek after God. And I have to say, my friend, if you feel backed into a corner, you feel desperate right now, seek after God. That is always the answer. Here Solomon is um, on his face before God, worn out from all the sacrifices, worried about how he's going to run the country. And God comes to Solomon when God has Solomon right where he wants him. And I've always heard it said in Sunday school classes growing up and, and even uh, uh, by others that God was sort of a genie in the bottle, if you would, to Solomon. And I think that uh, for what, uh, what our storybooks tell us that genie in a bottle, what it, what it does, that is sort of what happened here. God comes to Solomon and he says, ask me anything you want and I'll give it to you. Now, God didn't just willy-nilly ask that of Solomon. God knew the emotional state that Solomon was in. You remember when Hannah desperately wanted a baby? God allowed that wound to be barren until she got desperate. And then in her desperation, she cried out for a child. Now, I believe that Hannah had called out for a child many times before that. But God waited till he had Hannah right where he wanted her. Then he granted her petition. No different for Solomon here. Solomon was right where God wanted him. And God comes to Solomon and says, 
Tell me what you want and I'll give it to you. Reminds me of the verse in Psalm that says, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and He shall, what? Give thee, give thee the desires of thy heart. Now, as a young man, I always thought that verse meant that He's going to give me whatever my heart desires. But as I've grown in the Lord, I've realized that means He's going to give me the desire, and then He's going to give me the desire. You get the difference there. He puts the desire in your heart, and then He fulfills that desire. God had put the desire and need for wisdom down in the heart of Solomon, and then He comes to him and says, What is it that you want? And I'll give it to you. God wasn't surprised by Solomon's answer. God was the one that backed Solomon in the corner so that Solomon would ask for wisdom. And Solomon said, Lord, give me a discerning heart. Give me a discerning heart. And God was pleased with that request. God gave Solomon wisdom, but then he also granted him other things. He granted him national peace. There would be no war at all during the time Solomon was king. He gave him a boatload of money, boatload of money. Some uh, economists that study the Bible have estimated King Solomon uh, to be worth over $30 trillion. I don't think there's a trillionaire on the planet, $30 trillion. He had more money than he could have ever spent in multiple lifetimes. And then God gave Solomon a conditional promise. He said, if you will seek me with all your heart then I will give you a long life, give you a long life. Now, why did God grant these things to Solomon? You know, until this week, when I was putting this message together, it never dawned on me the connection between the passage here where God gives him these things and the building of the temple. Do you know that in order for God to be faithful to what he told King David, he had to give Solomon wisdom? He had to give him peace on every border. He had to give him money to build this temple. And he had to give him a long life. These were things that Solomon had to have if he was going to build the temple. God chose Solomon to give him these things so that he could be faithful in what he promised David that he was going to allow his son to do. Why? Because God is always faithful. He's always faithful. I have uh, several uh, books that I refer to when I'm looking for sermon illustrations. And uh, these are books that I have found to be uh, doctrinally accurate and filled with uh, good stories that I believe open up windows to helping us find the truth. And I just have to say this morning that every single illustration on faithfulness that I could find all had to do with the faithfulness of men. None of them had to do with the faithfulness of God. And I have to say that mankind, we are not very faithful, but He is. Let me give you a couple introductory thoughts this morning about faithfulness, and and these will be real quick, rapid fire, but I want to give you a couple of thoughts by way of introduction, and then we'll jump into the outline this morning. The first thought I want to give you by way of introduction is this, God is faithful to us even when we are not faithful to Him. Amen? God is faithful to us even in our lack of faithfulness. My friend, God does not choose when to bless you based on how you behave. God doesn't look down at you and say, oh, you didn't have a very good week this week, I'm going to stop loving you. Oh, you had a better week this week, I'm going to start loving you. God doesn't look down at you and say, uh, you know, um, uh, I'm, not going to, I'm not going to honor anything that you ask of me. I'm, I'm not going to be a God to you because you have just chosen to neglect me. Listen, God is faithful to us even in our absence of faithfulness, even in our unfaithfulness. And I have to say this morning, I am thankful for a faithful God who is faithful even in all of my character flaws and in all of my shortcomings. Every day I I seek the face of God and and I I ask Him to help me to be more like Him and in His image. Can I tell you, there are days I fall way short of that. Am I alone this morning in that? After there are days I fall way short of that. But you know what is a fact is that He never falls short. The Bible tells us that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's faithful. The second thing I want to say this morning by way of introduction is that God's faithfulness, it's flawless. It's flawless. It's perfect. His record is perfect. If the Bible says that God was going to do something, He always does it. If 
You know what a biblical promise is, right? God promises some things. God always comes through in his promises every time. I, I love that Jesus Christ, in his birth, life, death, resurrection, ascension, fulfilled every single Old Testament prophecy of his coming. He didn't leave one I undotted. He didn't leave one T uncrossed. Every prophecy was fulfilled. Why? Because God's faithful. He's faithful. There are these things in the Bible called conditional promises. How many of you are understanding of what a conditional promise is? God says, if you do this, then I'll do this. Do you know that there's never been a time where a Christian has done what the Bible says, where God did not come through? You think, well, one time I prayed to God and He didn't answer my prayer. God's not required to say yes. Sometimes God might say no. He might say, wait. He's allowed to do that. He's allowed to do that. If God's ever made a promise in the Bible that says, if you do this, I'll do this. And if you've done it, I promise you, God has come through on His end. Why? Because God's faithfulness is flawless. It's flawless. I believe today that many Christians struggle with faith in God because they do not adequately understand the faithfulness of God. That may have gone right over your head, so I'm going to say it again. Sit up and listen really close to what I'm saying here. I believe that many Christians struggle with faith in God because they do not adequately understand the faithfulness of God. The better we understand His faithfulness, the more confidence we have that He has our best in mind, no matter the consequences. No matter the, no matter the circumstances, rather. You might be sitting there going, I am in a nasty spot right now. And I know that several of you in this room are. Can I promise you something? God's not going to stop being faithful. He's not. To you, He's not going to stop being faithful no matter what the case is. Why? Because we have a God whose faithfulness is flawless. This morning, we're going to jump into Solomon's prayer. We, we read when he rose from his knee and he praised the Lord. We're going to back up and we're going to look at Solomon's prayer of dedication of that temple. And we're going to observe five characteristics of the faithfulness of our amazing God. So observation number one or characteristic number one, his faithfulness is preserved in Scripture. His faithfulness is preserved in Scripture. Look down with me at verse number 24 of 1 Kings chapter 8. We get right there at the beginning of Solomon's prayer. It says there, who has, this is Solomon praying, who has kept with thy servant David my father, that thou promisest him, thou spakest also with thy mouth, and hast fulfilled it with thine hand, as it is this day. God always comes through on His promises. Turn back over to 2 Samuel chapter 7, and we can see exactly what it is that Solomon is talking about. 2 Samuel chapter 7 and verse number 12, uh, Nathan here, God had gone uh, to Nathan. David had been petitioning God, can I please build you a temple? Can I please build you a temple? It's in my heart to build you a temple. And he had been begging God and begging God. And so God went to his prophet Nathan and said, uh, here is the message I want you to take to David. And here we have Nathan delivering that message to David. And again, you can read the whole chapter 7 there and get the whole story. But look at verse 12 there. The Bible says, And when thy days, speaking of David, be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, and uh, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He, and look at this, verse 13. He shall build an house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. God told David, he said, you're going to birth a child through your bowels, and that child is going to build me a house. Now, if you read on through there, you realize why God wouldn't let David build him a house. Why? Because David had blood on, bloodshed on his hands. He had killed many of the enemies of God. And God told David, because of the bloodshed, because you're a bloody man, I cannot allow your hands to be the main architect of my house. So that was why God gave Solomon peace on every side. You go back to that story there. Because David couldn't do it. Solomon couldn't have done it either if he'd have been sending men out to war. 
Solomon needed to be a man who knew no violence and saw no bloodshed. And so uh, God was faithful. He came through. And here Solomon, we find him on his knees dedicating this temple to the Lord. And, and, and he says, God, you have kept your word. You have come through on your promises. And I think about how that the faithfulness of God is preserved over and over and over again in scriptures. And it isn't just something that we can find in scripture. It's something that's around us everywhere. Let me, let me prove that to you today. We're all familiar with the seven days of creation, right? Day one, he, God created the day and the night. Day two, he created the heavens. Day three, he created the grass and the herbs and, and, the, and the trees. Day four, he created the sun, moon, and the stars. Day five, he put the winged creatures in the air and the water creatures in the sea. Day six, he created the beasts of the earth and he created man. And day seven, God rested. Now, you say, Pastor, what are you getting at here with the faithfulness of God? Do you understand that for every one of these things that God created, there is a very, very complex system involved with each one of them? Do you know why the sun comes up every morning and sets every evening because he's faithful. By the way, it comes up either a minute early or later to the second every day, depending on which side of June 21st we're on. It goes down the same way every day. I don't think that could have happened by an accident, do you? The moon rotates around the earth, creating high tides and Low tides. I'll throw an interesting fact at you here. If the earth was millions and millions of years old, the way evolutionists claim, you know the moon has been moving away from the earth as we have been tracking it by a certain distance for years. And it moves away the same distance every year. If you take it and move it that much closer to the earth, guess what would happen if you did that for millions and millions of years? It would flood the earth so many times no life could ever live. That by itself on its own takes evolution and chucks it out the window. You know, if you go get a molecule of water, and this bottle, and this bottle right here next to me is a bottle of water, do you know that every molecule of water in there contains two, two uh, atoms of, of, of hydrogen and one atom of, of oxygen? Why? Because God is faithful. God is faithful. The evaporation process and the distillation of the water in the sky and then the pouring back down is a system that God oversees. And why does it continue to happen? Because God is faithful. Life is given every day. Children are born into this world. We call that the miracle of life. Why do those, child, those children leave the womb of their mother having not breathed and then take that first gasp of air and begin screaming and shouting from the top of their lungs? Because God is is faithful. These are his systems. He created in Genesis 1. They are preserved in Scripture, his creation, and we get to witness them every day of our life. I made the comment to someone uh, recently. I said, if God, if, if the sun rose and set based on the consistency of your life, how regular would the sun come up? It's a challenging thought, isn't it? And God's faithful. He's perfect. We see number one, uh, characteristic number one of God's faithfulness. It is preserved in Scripture. Number two, notice His faithfulness punishes the iniquitous. His faithfulness punishes the iniquitous. Look down at verse 33 of, of chapter 8. And we look here in, in Solomon's prayer. Everybody look down at that verse with me, would you? And would you read the first word of the verse? What is the first word of verse number 33? When. When. When thy people Israel be smitten down before the enemy. Okay, so it's not a matter of if the children of Israel are going to get smitten down. It's a matter of when. Now, why would the children of Israel get smitten down because of the enemy? Well, uh, uh, Solomon explains. When the people of Israel be smitten down before the enemy, because they have sinned against thee. Here we see that if you sin against God, there are going to be consequences. Are going to be consequences. Now, it's a whole lot of fun to talk about God's faithfulness when it comes to, to nature, isn't it? And it's a whole lot of fun to talk about God's faithfulness when it comes to Him pouring down blessings on us. 
And it's a whole lot of fun to talk about how faithful God is when it comes to his protection of us. But it's a whole nother ball game to talk about God's faithfulness when it comes to talk about how he faithfully punishes us. We don't like to talk about that. God loves you. God loves you no matter how you behave. Do you know sometimes God's way of loving you is to drop a pay raise down on you? Other times, God sees that you're acting out of line and there is sin in your heart and He drops pain and hurt on you so that He can get your attention, but He always corrects and chastens in love. Every time. Every time. In the Sweetheart Couples class, I'm teaching through a series up there, and the idea is taking a simple one and making him a wise man out of the book of Proverbs. And right now we're talking about chastening children. Chastening children. And I've made the point very strong in class over the last uh, a couple of weeks that I have taught that you must chasten in a spirit of love. You can never chasten your child in a spirit of hatred or frustration or anger. The Bible tells us that the rod of wrath shall fail. Can I tell you who is an expert at chastening you in love? That's God. That's God. If you want more of a study on that, you can go to Hebrews chapter 12. Not today, but on your own. And you can study. That is the chastening chapter in the Bible. Proverbs chapter 3, God tells us about Him being faithful and punishing the iniquitous or faithful in punishing the wrongdoer. It says there in verse 11 of Proverbs 3, it says, My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary or wore out or tired of his correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father the son in whom he delighteth. How many here ever had a physical in your life? If you haven't, go get one. Amen? You need one. Um, you sit there in the doctor's office, and the, 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 they make you sit on that goofy-looking bed, you know, the one they pull the new, the new uh, uh, paper down on, and, you know, you're, you're sitting there, and they got you in this goofy-looking gown, and they take this hammer, right? And what do they do? They whack you on the knee. What are you supposed to do when you get whacked on the knee? You're supposed to kick, right? How many of you don't kick when you're ha you're, you get hammered? How many of you fake it? You kick just because you know you're supposed to. Anybody here do that? Okay, what do we call that? We call it a reflex, all right? How many of you have a reflex when someone scares you, hides behind the corner and scares you? How many of you, that reflex is violent? Heard of a guy on his honeymoon? Uh, he was carrying the bags into the room, and his wife was a jokester. She hid behind the door of the hotel room, and he came in with the bags, and she jumped out from behind the door and scared him. He dropped the bags, whap, punched her in the eye. They're walking around town. They got just married on the back of their car, and everyone's saying, are you guys newlyweds? And, he, and, and she said, yes. And he said, so they asked her, how'd you get that black guy? And, they, and she said, he punched me. Doesn't make for a very good start, does it? But uh, they've been married years. Everything's good now. But reflexes. God has a reflex when we do wrong. Let me say God tempers that reflex. And he, he, he masks that reflex with with love and long-suffering and patience. And God never punishes us more than necessary, but God always does punish us. Why? Because He loves us. You might be running from God today. If you're His child, let me promise you, He is going to punish you. Now you say, I know someone, they're living iniquitous, and I wish God would punish them right now. And I would say, when you do wrong, don't you want God to be patient and long-suffering with you? Isn't it funny how we want God to be quick and swift to punish others that are wronging us? But when we're the one doing the wrong, we want Him to be patient and kind. Now let me just say this morning that God does not punish other people who wrong us on our clock. He does it when He's good and ready. I'm here to tell you today that God's timing with punishment is always perfect. It may not fit our timeline, it may not fit our schedule, but it's always perfect. This morning I wrote down some different methods that God uses to punish, to punish the iniquitous. And so if you're taking notes, I'd encourage you to scribble these down. 
And this, is, this list is not all-inclusive. If, if we were to brainstorm together today, we could probably come up with several others. But these were three I wrote down. For sake of time, we'll give three, and then we'll move on to the next point here. Uh, methods God uses to punish the iniquitous. The first one I wrote down was He uh, sends consequences. Sometimes God's way of punishing us is just to step out of the way and let our sinful choices affect us. 1 Corinthians 6 tells us that our body is the temple of God. It's not our own. The principle there is that you ought not put things in your body that harm it. Smoking principally is against the Bible. Why? Because you are harming your body. Listen, when they've put a warning on a cigarette pack that says, caution, this will give you cancer, there's no really arguing that, is there? Sometimes God's way of punishing a Christian that wants to smoke is He just lets them get lung cancer. God just lets consequences run their course. You may be a heavy drinker. Just drink, 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 drink. You say, how, God, how is God going to punish me? God may just step out of the way. He may just let your relationships fall apart in your life because of your alcoholism. God may just step out of the way and let that poison that you're pouring, pouring down your throat uh, give you cirrhosis of the liver and take your life early. Sometimes God's way of punishing us is just to step back and let sin's consequences do its thing. Another method I wrote down here that God uses to punish the iniquitous and do so in a faithful way is the rebuke of others. Rebuke of others. Now, let me be clear here. I don't want a church full of people that run around sticking their fingers in each other's faces. You did this and you did that and you did this and you did that. Listen, get the beam out of your own eye before you go poking the moat out of someone else's. You ever had a Sunday school teacher or a preacher preach on a verse out of the Bible? God was like, God was having that, that, that teacher or preacher's finger right in your face. You are wrong. Sometimes God uses the rebuke of someone else. You may remember, uh, we, we were talking about Nathan and, and David earlier, how Nathan came to David with the news. Well, Nathan had to do something much more difficult with David just a few chapters before that. You remember when he messed up with Bathsheba and he had Uriah killed? What did Nathan do? He came and put his finger right in David's face. He said, thou art the man. And God was using Nathan to deliver the consequences for David's sin. There was another prophet that came to David after he had numbered the people and said, because you have numbered the people, you get door one, door two, door three of God to punish you, you pick. And sometimes God uses the rebuke of others as His method to punish the iniquitous. I wrote down one other here, and this is, uh, it's this, direct, uh, direct uh, um, uh, intervention, direct in in intervention, direct intervention. Sometimes God just steps in and just directly punishes us. Now, I said this this morning in the 830 service, and I think it bears repeating here. You will never see a hand appear out of heaven with a paddle in it that's just whack, 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 whack. Sometimes I wish it worked that way. It's swift, it's quick, and it's over. But with an all-powerful God, I don't know how that would feel. <laughs> My dad would spank me when I was a boy, and, and I needed it. I, I def definitely needed it. And let me say it didn't damage me. I still love my dad all the same, and, and, uh, and, and I'm not some wounded, uh, psychologically damaged child. I, I needed to be whooped as a little boy, and I'm, and I'm glad I was, and, and I'm glad my dad was big and strong. He, he, he gave me a whooping uh, at the age of 17, and, and I, he drew tears because he's that big and strong. And it wasn't that I was a pushover of a, of, of a young man. He was just a big, strong guy, and I, and I still am intimidated by him. I think if he were to come and, and chase me down and whoop me today, he could probably still get me to cry as uh, big and strong as, as, as he is and as intimidated by him as I am, but God isn't going to come down and give you a whooping or a spanking. Whooping is a good southern word, amen? Now, he's not going to come down and give you one of those, but what, what, uh, what he will do is sometimes he will use uh, circumstances to directly punish you. And I got to think it in preparation for this message about a time in my life where I felt that God directly punished me over sin, and, and I'm sure I could have come up with other instances, but I remembered the time when I was a Bible college student, and I was uh, short on my school bill by just a little bit, and I was beyond late. They gave you a little bit of a grace period to pay your bill, and if you didn't have it paid by a certain date, then this te the teachers would stand up with a list, and they would read your name as being financially withdrawn, then you had to walk out of class. 
There's all the embarrassment of having your name read and, and then uh, the sitting out of class and getting the absentee for the day. And, and, uh, and I, so I had to choose between putting my money in the offering plate and tithing or paying my school bill. Now, what should have I done? That's not what I did. I paid my school bill. If I remember right, the total was like $156 and change. That Sunday night, I was uh, leaving church, going down the same road that I had gone down for years from the, from the church back to the, the dorms at the college. I was going the same speed down that road that I had gone for years. I was speeding. Okay, uh, you, you know, you got those stretches of highway where you never, you, there's like never police officers, and you know you can speed and you're not going to get caught. What well, was that situation? By the way, seating, speeding's wrong, and, and, I, and I need to, that's something I need to work on, amen? But don't give me that pious look. Some of you speed too. Um, uh, but I was speeding down this road, and I was probably going 10, 11 over, and lo and behold, the Sunday after I didn't tithe, and I had put that money toward that school bill, there was a police officer hiding behind a building. Don't you hate it when they do that? And I got past him, and he pulled right up on my tail, and the lights came on, and he pulled me over. License and registration and insurance, I handed all over to him. He comes back, and he hands me the ticket, $156. The down to the dollar, what I had skipped in the offering plate. Down to the dollar. God was directly punishing me. Directly punishing me. Lesson learned, Amen. Lesson learned. Um, I, I, I try to be very faithful with tithing at this point. I, in fact, since then, I don't know that I've ever missed tithing. Uh, praise the Lord. Uh, uh, but uh, lesson learned. God will punish the iniquitous. You might be here today and you might be under the punishing hand of God and you might think that He's being unfair to you. Let me just say to you today is that God is always faithful. He's always faithful. And if you force his faithfulness to be that of punishment, he's going to come through and punish you. Number three this morning, first we saw that his faithfulness preserves, is preserved in scripture. We saw secondly that it is, uh, that it punishes uh, the iniquitous. Number three, we see his faithfulness pardons the repentant, pardons the repentant. God doesn't just punish the iniquitous because he hates them. In fact, God does not hate the iniquitous. You know what God hates? He hates the iniquity inside the heart. Look down at verse 34. 1 Kings 8, verse 34. Then hear thou in heaven and forgive the sin of thy people Israel, and bring them again to the land which thou gavest unto their fathers. Here Solomon was saying, there's going to be a day when these people, their, their children and, and grandchildren or great-grandchildren, somewhere down the line, they're going to forsake you. When, you. when they do, you're going to punish them. When you're forced to punish them, if they turn back to you, would you please pardon them? Now, how did Solomon know that God would do this? Again, Solomon had Israeli history to remind him of that. Had the children of Israel been sinful before this building of the temple and suffered the consequences of God? Yes, many times. I'm sure uh, Solomon was, was well versed in the story of the children of Israel marching through the wilderness. And they come there to the base of the mountain and up the mountain goes Moses to get the Ten Commandments and he's up there for several days and uh, the Israelites come to Aaron and say, uh, I, we don't know what happened to this Moses guy, but... But, but make us a God. Here are our earrings and our jewelry and our gold and make us a God. And, and uh, Aaron tells like the worst lie in the whole Bible. Like the most unbelievable lie in the whole Bible. Aaron was not a very good liar, was he? He, he said, all right, give me your gold. And he puts it in there. He shapes it in this golden calf. And Moses comes down when he questions Aaron on it. And Aaron says, well, I don't know. I just threw the gold in the oven and this is what came out. Like, um, No. Uh uh. I don't think so. You may remember Moses came down from the base, or from the mountain there. On his way down, Joshua was halfway, and Joshua says, There's a sound of war in the camp. What did Moses say? That's not the sound of war, that's the sound of music. Time out. Have your attention. If your music 
sounds like war, then your music is wrong. By the way, when he got down there, they were dancing around this golden calf with either very little on or nothing on. Say, but it's Christian rock. You can't have Christian rock. Rock and roll means sex and drugs. You can't have Christian of that. All right, timeout's over. So he comes down the mountain. They're dancing around the calf, nothing on. They're, they're bad music. Moses gets angry, what's he do? He smashes the Ten Commandments. He shouldn't have done that. But he smashed the Ten Commandments and he got angry on God's behalf. He shouldn't have done that either. But then the next thing he did was he took the golden calf and he ground it in a powder. And he stuck it in the water and he made the Israelites drink that golden calf. Drink that golden calf. You know what they did? They repented. And you know what God did? God forgave them. How about... Um, how about a few chapters later? And I'm, getting, I'm sure Solomon praying that prayer was remembering of these events. A few chapters later, there we find in the, in the Old Testament that the people are complaining. Ah, oh, this manna. I want to eat this, this, this manna. Uh, 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 we, we need more water. Uh, uh, we don't like the, 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 the wilderness. And complaining and complaining. It was their fault they were still there. This is after Kadesh Barnea. And, and God sends serpents, fiery serpents, to slither through. And what do they do? They bite the Israelites. And God tells Moses, he says, put a serpent on a rod. Walk through the camp. And those that are truly repentant, they will look and they will live. God gives another example of this faithfulness. and So we get the faithfulness of God before the prayer. And then we see the faithfulness of God after the prayer. Look at verse 35. And as you read this, those of you that know your Bible very well, think about what event this describes, this prophetically describes. Look at verse 35. When heaven is shut up and there is no rain because they have sinned against thee, if they pray toward this place and confess they, uh, thy name and turn from their sin when thou afflictest them, then uh, hear thou in heaven and forgive the sin of thy servant and of thy people Israel that thou uh, teach them the good way wherein uh, they shall walk and give rain unto thy land which thou hast given to thy people for an inheritance. Does that sound like a familiar story in the Bible? Now, after Solomon, you'd have a few kings, and with them would come Ahab. Remember old Ahab leading the children of Israel to, to worship Baal? And Elijah marches in and says, because of the Baal worship and the wickedness, it will not rain until I say so. Three and a half years later, Elijah shows back up. There's this, there is this showdown on Mount Carmel, and Elijah looks at the children of Israel and he says, how long halt ye between two opinions? How long will it be Baal? How long will it be God? You can't choose both. Pick one or the other. And they have the obviously the big sacrifice. We preached about that a few weeks back. And uh, the sacrifice of Elijah is consumed. What do the Israelites do? They say, Jehovah is our God. And they surround the false prophets and hold them down. And Elijah goes and eliminates each one of the false prophets. What did they do? They chose God. Elijah falls on his face before God. And he prays for rain. And what does God do? Just as Solomon asked God to do, he faithfully sent the rain. Why? Because God pardons. He pardons the repentant. This morning, let me say this, is that I believe that verse in 1 John that's quoted often is a verse that is very abused in Scripture. Which verse is that, Pastor? If we confess our sin, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sin. You know the verse. Let me explain what confess is, and then let me, well, first let me explain, explain what confess isn't. Confession is not getting down on your knees and saying to God, I did this, and I did this, and I did this, and I did this. Will you please forgive me? And then getting up and going back and leaving yourself in compromising positions to continue to do that. Let me explain. Let's say that you have a problem with smoking cigarettes, and God's really convicting you over that. You've got half a pack of cigarettes left. You get down on your knees and you say, God, please forgive me for smoking cigarettes. And then you get up off your knees and you hold on to the pack of cigarettes. You're really not repentant 
A repentance is the changing of the mind that leads to the changing of actions. You have some secret account that your spouse doesn't know about. You feel guilty over it. You get on your knees. Lord, please forgive me for this account and all the sin inside that account that's going on. But you get up and you don't delete and remove the account. You're not really repentant of your sin. If we confess, confess means a true repentance of the heart. If we confess our sins, you say, how can you tell if someone's truly repentant? Well, I reminded of the verse that says, Godly sorrow worketh repentance. Godly sorrow worketh repentance. Where is the godly sorrow? There is no godly sorrow. There is no true repentance. And I'll say today that God wants to pardon you, but you must first be repentant. And once you're repentant, you have a promise from God that He will pardon you of your iniquity. Number four, we see uh, His faithfulness provides salvation to the stranger. And I'll hasten. I've got two points and I'll move quickly through these. Look down at verse number 41 of 1 Kings 8. Maybe my favorite part of Solomon's prayer is right here because this part of the prayer includes how you and I get to get saved. Look at verse 41. Moreover, concerning a stranger that is not of the people of Israel, but cometh out of a far country for thy name's sake, for they shall hear of thy great name and of thy strong hand and of thy stretched out arm, and he shall come and pray toward this house. Hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place, and do according to all that the stranger calleth thee for, that all people of the earth may know thy name to fear thee, and do thy people Israel... Uh, as do thy people Israel, and that, and, and that they may know that this house which I have built it is called by thy name. I love this. Solomon says, this temple is so great and big and marvelous. I mean, look, the, the finest of wood was used, cedars of Lebanon, and everything was plated in gold. And it, it was just, look, uh, the, the finest hotel in the world would not hold a match up to how expensive of a place this was and how, how spectacular it was. If Solomon's temple was still around today, it would be one of the mod, uh, wonders of the world. It was absolutely spectacular to look at. And, and Solomon said, look, the name, your name, God, because of this building, is going to go out around the world, and people are going to come here seeking you. When they do, accept them. Honor their prayer. Now, why did Solomon feel comfortable praying that prayer? Again, we're talking about God's faithfulness. There must have been precedent set before Solomon that dictated that God would do this. Oh, wait a minute. What about Rahab? Rahab wasn't a Jew. The Bible says Rahab was a harlot. She was from the city of Jericho. She was a Gentile. She hid the men on her roof. She helped them escape. That were, that were spying out uh, uh, the land, surveying the land on how to uh, come up with a plan of attack, Rahab ended up becoming part of the lineage of Christ. Oh, wh wait a minute, what about Ruth? Ruth would end up marrying uh, Rahab's grandson, Boaz, and Ruth would be a Moabitess, not a Jew. And, and Ruth would marry uh, either Malon or Chilion and they would die. And Ruth would come back with Naomi and, and Ruth would marry into Judaism. No doubt Solomon knew the story. Wait a minute here. Uh, so we have here the past that Solomon's able to look at and see, God, you were faithful to accept the non-Jews. We looked at Esther on a Wednesday night a couple of weeks ago, and we looked at the verse there at the end of the book that says that many became Jews. They became Jews. What does that mean? They converted. Gentiles converted to Judaism. God is, His arm is outstretched to all who want to believe on the Messiah to be saved. You say, well, pastor... Has God been faithful to do that through Solomon? You know the story of Cornelius, right? Cornelius was not a Jew. He, he favored God. He was a, 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 the Bible says he was a man that uh, feared God, and he, he, he was seeking the truth, and God sent Peter to see Cornelius say, I think maybe the greatest answer or the most direct correlation with, with 1 Kings 8, uh, 41 to 43 is the Ethiopian eunuch, is it not? 
Here comes the Ethiopian eunuch from another country. He arrives at the temple. No, not the same temple, but at the temple, seeking the truth. Gets the book of Isaiah, or Isaiah, and he's heading home, searching for the truth. And here, as Solomon had prayed, if this happens, give them what they're asking for. And God sends Philip out of his way so that this eunuch can be saved. What was God doing? He was honoring the prayer that Solomon had prayed. You know, God is still in the soul-saving business today. How many of you here today are glad for that? You're going to heaven. You know, every week, because of the efforts of White Oak Baptist Church, nearly every week, if not every week, somebody in this area gets saved. Somebody gets saved. Between our uh, Friday evening addictions deliverance ministry and our nursing home ministry and our Tuesday evening visitation outreach and our Saturday morning bus soul winning uh, that takes place and uh, uh, the Wednesday evening, on Wednesday afternoon rather, the pastors go out for an hour, an hour and a half into the community and all of the all of you that take gospel tracts and go out and distribute them and witness, somebody is saved because of a church member at White Oak Baptist Church Weekly, And I have to say, I am so thankful to be part of a church that is following the Great Commission here in the area. Now, we have room for improvement, but we are doing what we've been commanded. I think of the Vacation Bible School that's getting ready to, to take place in a week. And I think back of the, the, the dozens of Vacation Bible Schools that have taken place at this church, and the hundreds of children that have been saved. Do you know every child that bows their head and with faith believes God saves every one of them? You know why? Because He's faithful. He's faithful. I mentioned this Wednesday night, but Wednesday I was sitting in my office doing some work and I got a text message from a church member. A church member who is not a Spanish-speaking church member. I want to do something here. How many of you here on some level speak Spanish? Would you raise your hand? Hold them high and keep them up for a minute. That's about half the crowd, okay? Uh, I love it. About half our church speaks Spanish. Amen? That's how you say amen in Spanish. Amen. So there, you learned a word today. One of our non-Spanish-speaking church members sent me a text this week and said, Pastor, I've met someone who is seeking my help for employment, but we can't communicate, and I am burdened for her soul. Her name is Anna or Anna. Would you be able to call her and witness to her? I called Anna up Wednesday afternoon, and after about 45 minutes of sharing the gospel with Anna on the phone, she bowed her head and she very sweetly got saved. Now, it's not about me. It's about God still being in the soul-saving business. Pastor Dave took my car over to uh, Bella Nepali's to get some pizza for the children who were going to be at the church during the, the mystery date night. And while he, was, he went in the restaurant on his way out, uh, there was a car next to him who needed a jump. Their battery was dead. And, and they said, hey, can you, give me a, can you give me a jump? And he said, this is not my car. It's my boss's car. But let me see if he's got any jumper cables. Sure enough, I had jumper cables in, in my car. When you have a 97 Honda Accord, you keep jumper cables in your trunk. Amen. Yeah. But uh, he pulled him out and he gave the, gave the guy a jump. And um, uh, he said, listen, you don't just need a physical jump. You need a spiritual jump. He walked them right down the Romans Road, and just a few minutes later, that, that person bowed their head, and they got saved. Hey, listen, I'm here today to tell you that God is faithful to save those that call upon Him out of a heart of repentance. One day, we're all going to spend eternity in heaven with God if we've made that decision. Why? Because He's faithful. He's faithful. I look back at the day I was saved, April 8, 1988, as a young boy, sitting on a pew in a church in Mississippi, and God saved my soul. You may be here today and you're not, you don't know for sure you're saved. Can I tell you this? God wants to save you. You say, I feel like I'm under the punished, punishing hand of God. And oh boy, I know how faithful He is at punishing me. I feel like it's a non-stop punishment. Will you, will you confess your sin? Will you come to Him and ask Him to forgive you? You say, Pastor, how do I get saved? Well, it's very simple. You can't get saved until you first realize you're lost. Your good works will not take you to heaven. You must see yourself as a sinner that's totally incapable of salvation on your own. You must accept that Jesus Christ came as God on the earth. He lived a perfect life. He, on the cross, He became your sin. He didn't just become your sin. He became the consequences of your sin. And if you'll call on His name, 
He'll save you. He'll save you. Number one, we see, say these with you. Number one, we see His faithfulness is preserved in Scripture. Let me hear you. His faithfulness is, number one, preserved in Scripture. Number two, it is, or it rather punishes the iniquitous. Number three, His faithfulness pardons the repentant. Number four, His faithfulness provides salvation to the stranger. And number five, His faithfulness is plenteous in restoration. Look back with me at 1 Kings chapter 8 and verse 46. Look at verse 46 with me. The Bible says, If they sin against thee, for there is no man that sinneth not, and thou be angry with him. Can we, can we pause the reading for a minute? As I'm reading this, will you put your name in there? Will you read this as though it's you? Let's start over. I'm, I'm not going to put a name in there, but just do that as we read along. Verse 46. If they sin against thee, for there is no man that sinneth not, and thou be angry with them, and deliver them to the enemy, so that they carry them away captives unto the land of the enemy far or near. Yet if they shall bethink themselves in the land whither they were carried captives, and repent, and make supplication unto thee in the land of them that carried them captive, saying, We have sinned, and, and have done perversely, we have committed wickedness. And so return unto thee with all their heart, with all their soul, in the land of their enemies, which led them away captive, and pray unto thee toward their land, which thou gavest unto their fathers, the city uh, which thou hast chosen, and the house which I have built for thy name. Then hear thou their prayer and their supplication in heaven, thy dwelling place, and maintain their cause. And forgive thy people that have sinned against thee in all their transgressions, wherein they have transgressed against thee, and give them compassion before them who carry them captive, that they may have compassion on them. Did this passage not prophetically take place? What did the Israelites do? They sinned and they sinned and they sinned and they sinned. And God allowed Nebuchadnezzar to come in and carry them away captive. Now you know that part in there where it says they're to pray toward the city? Which direction was Daniel praying toward when he was cast in the lion's den? Toward Jerusalem. You know what he was doing? He was praying and seeking God's face. There came a day where those Israelites, those Judeans, they had humbled their heart before God, and God allowed them to go home. You say, Pastor, what is the application you're trying to make this morning? Here it is. We have a God who's a God of second chances. Aren't you thankful for that? Aren't you thankful that He's a God that gives you chance after chance after chance? How many of you are like me in that if it was you or God, you would have already destroyed you a long time ago? Right? But He's faithful. He's faithful to say, okay, pick yourself up, dust yourself off, and go again. Some of you today, some of you today, are wayward from God. Can I encourage you to come back to Him and let Him restore you, put you on the right path, and experience the blessings of His faithfulness, not the punishment of His faithfulness? We serve a faithful God. And His faithfulness, His faithfulness is amazing. My friend today, how faithful are you in what He's called you to do? How strong is your faith in His faithfulness? Never doubt a God who is faithful. Let's have our heads bowed and our eyes closed this morning. How many here today would say, Pastor Lejeune, beyond all shadow of a doubt, I know that when I die... I know that my name is written down in glory. Not because of my good works or my good deeds, but because Jesus Christ died on the cross, rose again from the dead, and I have put my faith and trust in that finished work. Pastor, if I were to die today, my name is in glory. I'd go to heaven. If that's your testimony, would you slip up your hand? I know I'm saved. I know I've been rescued from hell. You can put your hands down. Is there one here today that say, Pastor, I don't know that. The truth is, if I were to die today, I... I don't really know what God would do with me. I'd like to think I'm going to heaven, but I'm just not really not sure. 
My friend, my goal isn't to embarrass you. It's not to pick on you, but it is to pray for you. With the privacy of the moment, with everybody's heads bowed and eyes closed, would you take that first step towards salvation and admit that you don't know that you have it? Is there one here today say, Pastor, if I were to die today, I just don't know I'd go to heaven. If that's you, would you just slip up your hand so I can pray for you? Quietly slip it up and slip it right back down. Is there one? How many here today would say, Pastor Lejeune, my faith has been weak because I have not fully grasped, understood, or I just have not been reminded lately of how faithful God is. Pastor, pray that God would take away the seeds of doubt, the weeds of doubt out of my heart. Pray for me, Pastor, that God would help me to live within the confines and the understanding of His faithfulness. If that's you and you're here today, you slip up your hand. Pastor, please pray for me. Who here today would say, Pastor, I feel like lately life has just kicked me in the gut. I'm going through a very difficult, very trying time. How many here today say, Pastor, pray for me that God would give me the grace to get through my trial. If that's you, just slip up your hand. Please pray for me, Pastor. I see those hands. My friend, God knows. God knows, and God's faithful. Could I encourage you, if you just raise your hand, make sure you're on the right side of the faithfulness of God. Lord, I do pray today that you'd help those who are struggling and hurting. Lord, some are hurting for someone. Some are hurting because someone else has sinned. Lord, you know each situation, each circumstance. And Lord, I I ask that you will do what I already know you will do, and that's be faithful in their lives. Love them. Show them that love. Lord, for those here today who are struggling with faith in you, Lord, I pray they be reminded of how faithful you are. May we never forget that. Lord, do a great work in our midst during this invitation. And Lord, may we cling to you and not push away from you any longer. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand to our feet with our heads bowed and eyes closed. The piano is going to play now and the altar will be open. Let me encourage you, if you raise your hand, whether it's because you're going through a hard time or you're just struggling with having faith and a faithful God, would you come and kneel? Would you talk to the Lord about that? Would you ask Him to help you to trust Him? Some of you here maybe need to come and really get confession truly defined in your heart and ask Him to help you with that. You may not be saved today. You may not know you're saved. Pastor Mike Rivera is standing down front here. He would love to take the Bible and show you how you can go to heaven. Some of you here today may be saved. You've never been baptized. Our baptistry here won't wash a single sin away, but it will identify you with Christ. It will help you to follow Him in that first step of, of, of being a believer. Others of you here may be saved and baptized, but you've not joined our church. Could I encourage you to come and make our church your home church? As the piano plays, let's make decisions for Christ right where, we're, right where we are. Let's sing that chorus together that Miss Rachel's playing together while others are still making decisions here in the front. Will you sing it with me? Ready? Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. 
Morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have needed thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto thee. I tell you what, let's sing that one more time. Let's do it without the piano. Will you sing it from the depth of your heart? Will you, th will you sing it as a song of devotion to God? Ready? Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have needed thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto thee. What a great reminder this morning from a powerful prayer from King Solomon. And may we be reminded all week long at just how faithful God is. If you ever begin to doubt that, get up early enough to watch the sun rise. Or sit outside and watch the sun go down. Just be reminded, as faithful as he is to bring it up and put it down, he's faithful to keep his promises in our lives. Amen. Thank you so much for your faithfulness to God's house today. And I hope we'll be back tonight. Last week we looked at James chapter 4, the first four verses. This week we're going to continue expositorily down through verse number 10. We're going to talk about how to be restored to God when we have not been faithful to him. And so I would ask you to make sure you're here and be in your place at 6 o'clock. We've got a lot of exciting things coming up. Pray for our teenagers that are going out of town this week. And pray for our safety and that God would do a work in their hearts and lives. I love you. It's a joy and honor to be your pastor. God bless you. You're dismissed.